Good evening, one and all. Welcome, one and all. Uh, my name's Nick Reid. You're allowed to sit. Thank you very much. My name's Nick Reid. I'm the Deputy Chair of Academic Board at the University of New England, and uh, I'm your Master of Ceremonies for this evening. On the auspicious occasion of uh, yet another 2012 inaugural lecture from one of our professors at UNE, Mark Perry. Uh, and his title, of course, is Law Meets Science. Um, I have to uh, do a couple of uh, tasks now. Firstly, I'd like to uh, do the acknowledgement of country. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional inhabitants of this land we call New England and show respect for their elders past and present. I also have uh, a long list of apologies. I, I won't read them all out, but I'd like to acknowledge the apologies from the Chancellor, the Honourable Dr Richard Torbay, and the apology of the Vice-Chancellor, Professor Jim Barber, who can't be with us, and as I said, there are many other apologies as well. Uh, my first task is to introduce to you the Deputy Chancellor of the University of New England, Dr Jeff Fox. And I might add, as I introduce him, that he has just recently been appointed to the position of Deputy Chancellor, and so we must congratulate him on his new appointment. Jeff. Thank you, Professor Reid. Can you all hear me? Yes. Good, thank you. Um, I'm actually acting for um, our Chancellor, um, so I'll just say that uh, um, he very much regrets that he's unable uh, to be here tonight, and he extends his apologies. Um, he's just getting to Sydney to attend uh, some parliamentary meetings. Uh, distinguished guests, good evening and welcome to you all, particularly those who have come from outside the university. The inaugural lecture series is a great tradition of this university. The lectures are a demonstration of the linkage between the Armadale community and the university. The academic activity of the university is not carried out in isolation. The health and the vibrancy of scholarship and of research at the university is a key element in the vibrancy of the local and regional community. This is recognised by the University Council, by university management and by the academic board. Please be assured that we do not neglect our origins as a regional university that the community worked so hard to establish. Our mission is to provide outstanding education and research relevant to the region, particularly in distant education. This is the final lecture in the inaugural Shear series uh, for 2012. The earlier lectures in the series were, first, Why Weeds? A Tale of Survival. This was delivered by Brian Sindel from the School of Environmental and Rural Science. The second was Life is Full of Trade-Offs, and this was presented by Oscar Cacho of the Business School. Third, we had Building Medical Workforce in Your Community, Everyone's Business, and this was given by Nikki Hudson from the School of Rural Medicine. Undisciplined English, Pirates, Prospects, Professors uh, was given by Russell McDougall in the School of Arts. And finally, uh, Cutting the Carbon Footprint of Food was presented by Annette Cowie of the School of Environmental and Rural Science. For those of you who have been privileged to hear some or all of these presentations, I think you will agree that UNE has been tremendously successful attracting and retaining renowned world-class senior academics. Their accomplishments, experience and dedication to education and teaching has been a key factor in the five-star ratings awarded the university for good teaching and overall satisfaction for both undergraduates and postgraduates. UNE has held both these records longer than any other Australian university. Tonight is the final lecture in the inaugural series for 2012. Professor Mark Perry is an excellent recruitment for this university and joins an outstanding school under the leadership of Professor Michael Stuckey. Professor Perry will tell us that the law meet, when, that law meets science reminding us that law's role is very largely to work with experts in specialised fields to facilitate their objectives. 
I'm sure we're in for a great treat. Now, may I introduce uh, Evelyn Woodbury, the Pro Vice Chancellor, Students and Social Inclusion, who will give you a picture of the School of Law's position in 2012. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, it's my pleasure this evening to represent the Vice-Chancellor, who also, as you have heard, sent his apologies for his inability to attend this evening. It's also going to provide you with a, a bit of background on the School of Law and the status at the present time. Uh, the School of Law was established in 1993 and has developed a, a, an important position in Australia legal and scholarly community. So in 2013, very clearly, it'll be celebrating its 20th anniversary. As the country's largest and most experienced distance provider of legal education, it provides opportunities to undertake Australian legal studies for people living anywhere in the continent and beyond who might otherwise lack these opportunities. It boasts very high levels of satisfaction from its students who often acknowledge that their success is largely due to the opportunities that they would not have had without UNE's School of Law. Under its new head, Professor Michael Stuckey from the UK, the school aims to maintain and, where possible, improve its research performance. Partly, this involves improving its performance under the conventional measures of research performance, external grants, ERA rankings and Heard C publications. However, as numerous statements from the Council of Australian Law Deans has noted, this science-dominated paradigm does not capture the full range of the research texts carried out in law. Scholarly research can be found in teaching and practitioner texts, as it can be found in research reports prepared for governments and NGOs. This latter component of research output is particularly important for the school's research centre, the Centre of Agricultural Law, where multidisciplinary teams conduct research on wide-ranging areas of policy relevant to rural and regional Australia. The past 12 months have been a time of change for the school, with a number of senior academic staff leaving and a number of new colleagues joining the school. These have included tonight's speaker, Professor Mark Perry from Canada, Professor Mark Lunny, who has returned to UNE after a short period at ANU, Associate Professor Lillian Corbin from La Trobe, Dr Saurabh Gian from India, Dr Ottavio Quirico from Italy and Mrs Fran Wright from the UK. The school actively promotes research by maintaining a variety of sources of funding to support its research. It also sponsors the Kirby Seminar Series, where leading academics and professional lawyers are brought to Armidale to present seminars to the school and the wider university community. The school also hosts an annual lecture, the Sir Frank Kitto Lecture, Memorial Lecture, and the list of speakers for this lecture represents an outstanding collection of academics and members of the judiciary and is a testament to the prestige attached to the lecture. This year's lecture will be held on Friday, the 23rd of November, at 3 p.m. in the John Dillon Lecture Theatre in the EBL building, and will be presented by the Honourable Bob Debus. The title of the presentation is The Devil's Triangle, Civil Liberty and the Relationship Between the Law, the Media and Parliament. And everyone is welcome to attend the public lecture. The research of members of the school covers a wide range of areas. A primary focus is on research with a rural and regional focus, and this is represented through the Centre of Agricultural and Law. Created just under 10 years ago, the Centre has been enormously successful in generating uh, traditional and non-traditional research outcomes. It has a number of full-time members of staff, including the Director, Professor Paul Martin, and the Deputy Director, Dr Amanda Kennedy. Details of the current research activity of the centre is listed on their web page. It's worth pointing out that apart from research outputs, the centre has been very successful in attracting a high quality cadre of higher degree research students. A number of other staff members have established research reputations in their fields. Our new colleague, Professor Mark Perry, who is speaking tonight, has an international reputation in the intellectual property and information technology areas and is a participant in a number of internationally externally funded research projects. 
Professor Mark Lunny is a leading legal historian in Australia and together with Professor Stuckey, who has also published extensively in this area, and Francis Wright, the school has one of the higher concentrations of expertise in this area in Australia. This has been recognised by the proposal that the School of Law host the 2014 annual conference of the Australia and New Zealand Law and History Society. There is also considerable strength in tort law, property law, medico-legal jurisprudence, international law and constitutional law. This strength has been bolstered by the appointment of staff with strong research credentials and by a number of staff undertaking PhDs to improve their research performance. The school is proud of its performance and knows there is much work to do. It is work, however, that is consistent with UNE's long tradition and history as a university committed to improving the world we live in through increasing knowledge. Research is necessary because, among other things, research-led and scholarly teaching is the hallmark of a university. In a competitive world, we can distinguish ourselves from others by this focus. It's now my pleasure to introduce Professor Eilish Magna, the Chair of the Academic Board, to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you. This is my last opportunity to introduce a Professor Royal inaugural lecture. And as those of you who have been to these events before will know, there is a large element of personal take in my introductions. In this vein, I take the opportunity to note that this is the second inaugural lecture ever to be given by a professor in the School of Law. My own inaugural lecture was developed, devoted, sorry, <laughs> delivered in this hall in July 2001. We have had holders of professorial appointments in the school since then, in part the fact that they were not invited to uh, deliver inaugural lectures reflects the tradition that we do not invite heads of school to deliver, deliver inaugural lectures. Uh, whatever other reasons there were, uh, this is our second inaugural lecture. Mark Perry took up his appointment in the school in June of this year. Three quick statements at the outset, capturing my impressions of Mark. The first is that he is a man of few words. I have no fear, therefore, that he will detain us past our closing time. The second is that he is a man of the world. The third is that he is a really nice guy. Okay. Mark came to us from the University of Western Ontario. But he was born and brought up in the southwest corner of England. His mother was from New Zealand. His father, he tells me, was an Englishman, was born in 1900, so was a true Victorian, as was the house they lived in. When asked specifically because of a fetish of mine or a thing of mine, he admitted the house he grew up in had several bay windows. Mark received his LLB with honours from Manchester University in 1976. His comment on his choice of university is that he was putting distance between himself and southwest England. He took his practical legal training, but it convinced him that life in a law office was not where he saw his future. He spent the next several years moving around Europe from non-legal job to non-legal job. In 1992, he took a basic certificate equivalent to an Australian diploma from the National Computer Science Centre back in London. He adds in the UK, but that's because he's from London, Ontario, recently. Uh, I would say from London, okay? Uh, that's because I've been away from Ontario for a long time. He then commenced work in that discipline. From 1985 to 1990, he was based in Japan, working in that industry as a data processing manager and tutoring part-time in education. 
He followed his mother then to New Zealand and spent a year as a shepherd at Rokawa Station, Hawke's Bay. In 1992, he commenced employment with the University of Auckland as Information Technology Manager in the School of Law. He holds qualifications from that university in computer science and in law, receiving the Master of Jurisprudence with distinction, first class honours, in 1998. Having commenced his career as a teacher of law at the University of Auckland, he moved to London, Canada in 1999, where he held a joint appointment in the Faculty of Law and the Faculty of Science. Uh, Department of Computer Science as Assistant Professor from 1999 to 2005, Associate Professor from 2005, and Professor as of 2012, until of course we managed to kidnap him in June of this year. Subsequent to Mark's appointment in the School of Law, his partner, Priti Krishna obtained an appointment in the School of Science and Technology, and although Priti was delayed by immigration formalities, I'm delighted to report that those have been overcome and she is in the audience tonight. Mark tells me that he met Priti when in search of a scientist to collaborate on a research grant, and that while they have contemplated marriage, they have not been able to find the time for a two-week Hindi ceremony so have not taken that step. Mark's research record is impressive. He is a named investigator for 27 grants, is co-author of two books and 11 book chapters, has published 54 refereed articles, and made numerous other contributions in a number of forms. At the University of New England, of Western Ontario, not New England yet, he supervised a number of research projects at Dr masters and honours level with 24 completions as well as teaching a number of units in intellectual property, computer science, software law, technology and biotechnology law. He also accepted a range of administrative duties on numerous committees including the promotions and tenures committee for both law and science. Uh, he chaired the University of Western Ontario's Information Technology Resource Centre Management Board for a while, and he made a number of other contributions. I think I have demonstrated the proposition that he is a man of the world and an academic of worth. I rely on personal experience and accounts from colleagues in the school for the proposition that he is a nice guy, and we will see tonight if he's always a man of few words. So, good evening, Armadale, and those from the university. I wish to thank, first of all, the University of New England and the city for giving me this opportunity to address you this evening. I shall be talking a little bit about uh, generalities, things about law, science, uh, things that you see every day in the press, but then I shall talk uh, more about my own research in the area of biotechnology law. I think we all know, and I know there's many lawyers here tonight, that uh, there are many interpretations of what law is, where it comes from, why we have it, how it works. But I suppose the simple def dictionary definition is a good start that is a system of rules uh, which a particular country or community recognises as regulating its actions. There are some tendencies we find in legal systems everywhere, such as it tends to support the status quo. You don't find that so much in academia, but certainly inside the judiciary, inside the profession, you do tend to see a support for the status quo as the de facto starting position. It is also naturally very slow to change, which of course is a good thing. If we were changing our laws all the time, you wouldn't know what they are. Most of us don't know what they are, um, even though they don't change all the time. <laughs> so politics, policy, law, these are really intricately linked all the time. And although jurists have spent centuries wondering about the meaning of law, the source of law, the type of law, whether it's natural law, whether it's uh, uh, Whatever, whatever you might think it might be, 
Um, I'm not going to talk about that today. There are jurisprudents who will no doubt in the future have the opportunity to tell you these things. Science 2, I shall try and sum up in just a sentence. A systematic investigation of nature to create knowledge of our universe through hypotheses, testing, evaluation, and restatements of our hypothesis. The tendencies with science are that it's tending to speed up. It goes faster and faster all the time. A lot of this is to do the, with the technology that we have today. Um, in 1953, to sequence some DNA was a meticulous and extremely slow hand process. Now, today, we have high throughput sequencing where you can get small genomes in a matter of days. So this is a huge change with information technology, biotechnology, and other technologies really faster and faster changing the way we live our lives. Some of these developments I would call disruptive science. The Academy Screw, probably at its time of introduction, was a disruptive science only in the sense that it improved the lot of people very rapidly by providing a means of irrigation that wasn't there before. However, just looking at the last few years, we can see more disruptive science that are causing some uncomfortable relationships between members of our society. So I just chose at random, really, because there are so many recent IT developments in the last decade or dozen years. 2000, I had to put in Google's first billion web pages because it seems such a long time ago now. In 2000, 12 years ago, they had already indexed one billion web pages. The estimate now is somewhere between 45 billion and 400 billion. It's very hard to know exactly what the number is. In 2001, we have Wikipedia and BitTorrent being released for the first time. Wikipedia now has become the major encyclopedia that's used around the world. It gets 45 million hits or more a day. That's people looking for information about things. It's also reasonably accurate. Some science paper determined it was as accurate as Britannica. Of course, Britannica published its last edition this year. It's no longer being published. BitTorrent, you may have heard of, is a technology that allows rapid sharing of files. It is actually a very good technology. It saves bandwidth, it saves wasted server space, but of course it has been used in ways that upset some sectors of our society. 2003 saw the introduction of Second Life, a virtual environment where I believe the University of New England has a space, indeed an island, where you can go and participate in events. Incidentally, I held a conference in 2005 in Second Life, which was quite an interesting event because we were hijacked by people who kept throwing us out of our space. But that's something else. 2004, we see Facebook, which is now ubiquitous. We see Gmail, which pretty much everyone uses at some point, or at least receives mail from Gmail. We have Twitter, 2006. The iPhone 2007 and now we have the iPhone 5 this year. Data mining is a technology that has allowed us to extract data from metadata from data that we already have in ways that you wouldn't have believed before. And just this year we have the ability to personalize 3D printing. You can buy for about $1,500 your own three-dimensional printer. These things really are incredible achievements in just a dozen years. The problems with these new technologies is that they do not sit comfortably with many of the laws that we have in place. Google Maps, for example, created huge problems when it first came out with very detailed photography of the Earth, because you could see people's cars, you could even see their faces. You could see, if you looked on Google Maps, the car that was parked outside uh, my house in Canada, for example. <coughs> also, 
Google engaged in some activities that they shouldn't have while they were collecting their uh, images of roads for their street view technologies. In North America, they were not only cycling around or driving around collecting photos, but they were also collecting data from open Wi-Fi networks and storing that data, which is a little on the outrageous side. Of course, this is not a good thing for most people. Most people believe that some kind of privacy should be engaged in, not only with their uh, inside the house, but also things that you wouldn't expect to share with the rest of the world. You know, how many rows of tomatoes you have in your back garden is really nobody's business except your own. Gmail, which I've had for many years, is really a very good and efficient mail system. It rarely falls over, it keeps on going, but there's one small drawback is that every email that goes through Gmail is scanned by Google and they have access to all the keywords that you use or that comes to you to your Gmail account. Your browsing habits when you use search engines, these two are collected by Google. I'm not picking on Google, it's just Google is one very large example of uh, the use of technologies to capture information about individuals that have privacy effects. Everyone will be aware of copyright issues over the last decade or so, uh, issues with downloading MP3s, that's music files, issues with downloading movies, issues with people copying texts, even inside the university, dare I say it, students copying materials and submitting them. All of these uh, have copyright implications that are not naturally dealt with in copyright laws that have developed slowly in our uh, English-based culture since 1710 in a common law culture. It's taken centuries to develop a form of copyright that strikes some kind of balance between the rights of the author and the rights of the users of the information that's uh, published by the authors. Patents, recently Apple and Samsung, you see again a, a, a huge battle happening between technology giants. Some people say it's trivial, but these things go to the basis of the technologies that we use every day. How much lockup should there be on designs and shapes, for example? Twitter, certainly in Australia, this has been an issue, uh, the issue of cyberbullying, people sending twits. Tweets, <laughs> tweets to twits, some would say, <laughs> or, or tweets from twits. Apparently, it is impossible not to read your twits, tweets. <laughs> so, I have a Twitter account, but I just don't read it, because <laughs> it's too annoying. So, we also have issues such as crowdsource lynching, as I call it, where you have the ability for thousands of people to pass comments on what they think should be done to somebody accused of some offence, thus perhaps denying them from the ability of reaching a fair trial. There are other issues. Spam. Who doesn't get spam? Domain name squatting, people taking those earls and using them for their own ends. Hacking, trademark use, data mining, database rights, etc., etc., etc. If you, well, I did, I just scanned yesterday's papers. So the Sydney Morning Herald had hacking of medical devices. If you have a medical device, it's probably not shielded from somebody hacking into it. If somebody hacks into your pacemaker, this could be unpleasant, to say the least. <laughs> Mobile data cuts in the paper, the, the data on your mobile phone, the amount you can use is going to be reduced. Lots about apps for your phones, lots about so social media, uh, some comments on free fibre access in New York City, some information on Dodo and Australian Post customers having their accounts exposed online. And something good at last, Nectar Research Cloud, which we will all be able to make use of. In the US, it's the same kind of story, hacking of tax records, more suing by Apple, Google, Motorola, MOOCs, which I know our Vice Chancellor is very keen on talking about. New York smartphone withdrawals following Sunday, people are suffering from not being able to reach their smartphone and getting anything off it. In the UK, much the same story again, Google, piracy sites, uh, iPads, with three million iPads were sold in three days, it's extraordinary. The positioning of phone masts, 
there's a continuing debate uh, about the safety of uh, telephone masts and fines for naming victims. This reflects a bit on what's been happening here on social network. And our friend Kim Dotcom uh, in New Zealand is going to sue the US government and set up a massive website free for everybody, should he be successful. But I'm not talking about that today. That's one aspect of science that I have done quite a lot of research on and published a bit on, and you will see in the papers every day. Today I really want to focus more on law and biotechnology, an area of science that I have been fascinated with over the last dozen years as well. Of course I can't talk about it all, I shall just talk about the issues that I have come across that I have found particularly interesting and that I have time to talk about today. So what is biotech? I rather like my definition, which is just simply applied biology, but there are longer ones that you can find uh, in textbooks and indeed even in the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity. Biotechnology is any technological application that uses biological systems, living organisms, or derivatives thereof to make or modify products or processes for specific use or in a textbook using living organisms or their products for human benefit, I like that phrase, to make a product or solve a problem. And of course it's not new. In China, there's a little pot there assembled, um, but they have found evidence that the Chinese some 9,000 years ago were using molds and yeast to produce alcohol. There's a science paper on that. And indeed there's another paper on how they were breeding geese, that's a duck, I know, but I couldn't find a goose. <laughs> they were breeding for better strains of goose in Egypt some 4,000 years ago. And we all love our blue cheeses and our breads and our other sources, um, beers, etc., that have relied on biotechnology over the centuries. There are many, many legal problems with biotechnology. Of course, there are other problems um, which I'm not going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about uh, religious problems, ethical problems, uh, anti-nuclear advocates, greenies, etc., etc. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not going to give an opinion, really, about what I think is good or bad. I'm just going to point out some of these problems. So one of the problems which does raise a lot of ire is the idea that you can patent human materials, so that if you take a gene and isolate it from a human being, providing no one's done it before, then you can potentially get a patent on it. Also, if you take a gene, sequence it, and put the sequence on a database, you may in fact attract other intellectual property rights, such as copyright on the sequence of GATCs, or in Europe at least, um, the sui generis database rights on that information. GM foods, recombinant DNA being used to make uh, crops, of course is also a risky topic to talk about. Uh, every time I've been to a conference that has involved GM foods, there have been people outside with placards saying, stop poisoning my baby or whatever. It's very difficult to talk about some of these things without raising a great deal of emotion. However, when we're talking about transgenic foods, we have to think about the balance between what kind of regulation that we need to make sure that we balance the risk involved with at least, not perhaps starvation in Australia, but a dearth of good crops. This is particularly so with uh, the advent of climate change and indeed in a very dry country uh, like Australia, the problem with drought resistant plants could be aided by GM crops. Cloning, some people say, is an abomination. The use of cloning techniques they think should be outlawed everywhere under any circumstance. Some kinds of cloning, however, for example, the um, development of stem cells, or even sometimes with human uh, fetuses using donated eggs, can perhaps provide hope to people who might have 
a disease that they would otherwise pass on to their offspring. Stem cells, much based on cloning. Bioweapons. Nobody likes the idea of bioweapons, but if people are developing bioweapons, do we need to see how they're developed so that we can create vaccines against potential bioweapons? And biodata, of course, there are many privacy issues on who is collecting your DNA, what they do with it, where it goes, what it's used for. Is an insurance company going to deny you insurance because you had a test, a blood test, 10 years ago that showed you had a propensity for heart disease? These questions all come up in the policy legal area, as well as in the highly emotional areas of ethics. So here's a little chart again. There are hopefully things not popping up on the screen. <laughs> Never mind. I'll try and remember what it said. <laughs> so 1982. I think that was the date in which um, uh, recombinant DNA was first used to make a transgenic crop. So that is quite significant in the uh, genetically modified food and crops uh, story. In 1994, from memory, that's when Flavor Saver tomatoes were released to the market. Flavor Saver tomatoes were GM tomatoes that had been altered so that they would keep better on the shelves. They weren't, however, altered to make them firmer at picking, so that they were picking soft ripe tomatoes, so that um, they tended to bruise easily in transport, which was a problem for the uh, flavour saver sellers. Also, they chose an original variety, which wasn't very good to start with when they made the flavour saver tomatoes, which was a poor cropping variety and didn't have a very good taste. So, of course, flavour saver didn't go too far. There was another variety that was used in uh, the UK to make tomato sauce that had a slightly better history. So, <clears throat> in um, 2000, what happened in 2000? I've forgotten. But 2011, <laughs> I can tell you that Australia planted its largest ever hectare of cotton. And 99.5% of that cotton was based on biotechnology. 99.5% of Australian cotton is biotech. And most of it was using stacked trait biotech, sort of V2 biotech, which was both herb resistant and uh, um, herbicide resistant and insect resistant. Australia also grows quite a lot of uh, herbicide tolerant Roundup Ready, probably canola. And I can't remember the other 2011. <laughs> but I'm sure it was very interesting. <laughs> when, when I post the slides, I'll fix it. I don't know why I lost that. That's crazy. That's technology for you. So one of the problems uh, that we face as regulators is that how are these issues described? Not only as lawyers, but also as consumers in the marketplace. You will go to a market and you'll find natural foods for sale or organic foods. What do we mean by an organic or natural food? The corn on the left is probably quite natural. This was from a strain found in from 5 AD, you know, a couple of thousand years ago. And this is the corn you got those days. You got a corn cob with about six little pieces of corn on it. Now that's great if you only want to eat six little pieces of corn. <laughs> However, if you want to make a meal of your corn, you probably need one of our natural versions on the right, which has been produced by many years of breeding and interbreeding and domesticating uh, corn. So, as uh, uh, Sir Francis Bacon said, we've been torturing nature for our own ends to create crops for centuries. So-called natural breeding is something I'm writing a paper on at the moment, is that Standard varieties that we call natural crops were developed by using X-rays or gamma radiation or chemical mutagens, some of them as early as the beginning of last century, in order to induce mutations and then just pick the ones that grew well. 
when I first found this out a couple of years back, I was rather surprised. For example, cow rose rice was developed using gamma rays in 1976. The above wheat strain was developed using uh, sodium azide, as well as thermal neutrons. Alamo oats, x-rays, the Rio red grapefruit. In fact, all the red grapefruit came from uh, a strain that was developed through mutagenesis. The ice cube lettuce, believe it or not, comes from a line developed using a chemical mutagen, ethyl methane sulfonate. There are many of these, the seafarer bean and so on and so forth. So when we're talking about a natural crop and what we think of as natural foods, we have to really go back and dig a little bit deeper. Do we really want to use only seeds that we dig up from uh, ancient ruins in Egypt that are two or three thousand years old? Probably not. So where are we going to draw the line as to what is natural breeding and what is not natural breeding? 40% of the world's population probably have wheat as a staple diet. And this has been developed over 8,000 years of cross-breeding of einkorn wheat um, to produce these domestic grains, which are bigger, stronger, better, but they wouldn't survive naturally. They need quite a lot of looking after to get a good uh, wheat crop. So what do we mean by genetically modified? Are we only talking about these new techniques for genetic modification, or are we going to include some of the other things which are clearly not very nice, uh, exposing uh, seeds to radiation, in our unnatural definitions? The other problem is that a lot of people, when they're talking about uh, these uh, genetically modified products, or genetically modified organisms will only worry about the ones where there are clear alternatives. People tend to ignore, for example, humulin, which is made by genetically engineered bacteria. You do not see many websites saying, stop making humulin, it's going to kill our babies. Vaccines too, such as the hepatitis B vaccine in 1981, and other trials of other vaccines have been made using um, transgenic methods. So I'm not saying these transgenic crops or transgenic uh, 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 organisms are a good thing. I'm just saying that if you're going to point out that they're evil and bad, you have to think about what are the alternatives? Where did our alternatives come from? And why are you now drawing a line in the sand? So even when we think we know what we're talking about, and on good days I think I know what I'm talking about, there are many different approaches that people take. The science approach often is, ah, we can fix that. We know what we can do, we'll look into it, we'll find some kind of solution through our new technologies, typically. Another cry is that Mother Nature knows best. Had you just gone through uh, Hurricane Sandy, you would not say Mother Nature knows best at all. You'd say, this is a really bad thing, nature. I'd rather be able to control it. Uh, yet others would say life, of course, is in the domain of God and that we shouldn't mess about with our products. Others, yet again, say we can control it by having a law against it. And that really has been some of the approaches taken in Europe, although they're softening at the moment. Something that we need to consider is how we approach our problems. We regulate a lot of things. We say wear a seatbelt in your car, don't drink and drive. We say don't smoke, but the regulation against it is quite weak simply because there's so much pressure from the tobacco companies to keep us smoking. And people who are addicted like it, of course. We have to talk about risk and understand what risk means. We say these BT corn crops are unproven to be safe. Of course, you can't really prove something to be safe. You can prove something is not safe. For example, 
If your corn, corn has Fusarium ear rot, the most uh, common ear rot disease in the US at least, you'll find that these, uh, this rot produces mycotoxins which will in fact eventually destroy your liver, at least has been shown to form uh, tumours in human livers. And it's fatal to horses and pigs even. So when you're talking about messing about with nature and saying we don't know whether it's safe or not, you have to also consider the other alternatives. Are you going to eat a lot of pesticide and fungicide on the so-called natural corn, which has been developed maybe through mutagenesis or other crossbreeding techniques? Or are you going to have your BT corn, which at least for a while prevents fusarium rot because it's caused by bugs? The person in the street, when they see words such as cloning, GMOs, genetic testing, etc., on this list, they will usually have a slightly visceral reaction against it. Perhaps some of this is due to bad propaganda, but perhaps a lot of it is due to not knowing what these terms really mean. Each of these areas is a high highly contentious area due to our different perspectives. In the US, they're still battling over gene patents, surprisingly. Uh, in May 2010, a federal judge struck down the BRCA1-2 gene patents that Myriad in the US has. The decision, of course, was appealed, and it was overturned on appeal, but a split decision. So this means that two judges think the patent should be overturned and two think it shouldn't. So it will probably end up in the Supreme Court in the USA. And at least this throws some doubt on the ability to patent human genes in the US. I have a feeling that the status quo will prevail, as it usually does, but at least this throws some more light on the issue as why this is an issue. In India recently, they tried to release a GM aubergine, which apparently is very good. It would double the crop of aubergine growers. However, there are issues, in, particularly in, in India, with aubergines, which they call brinjal, as you can see in the uh, time magazine there, the India News or whichever it is. The point is that they grow so many different types of aubergine, hundreds of different types, that people were worried not only that there might be problems with this BT version, but also that there would be a move away from growing the traditional many, many different varieties which have different properties and different tastes and flavours. So there was a moratorium imposed and the BT brindle has not been released. So why do we have these strange uh, uh, different perspectives on these biotech issues? I suppose a lot of it comes from the media um, and Hollywood and I suppose a lot of it is simply to do with the fact that we're alive and we don't really like the idea of something changing the nature of life. I think the yuck factor as one of my colleagues, uh, a doctor, used to say. There is also this huge confusion in the terminology, and that really needs to be sorted out so that people know what you're talking about, both policy makers, lawyers, politicians, scientists, and the public at large. So what do we want to do when we address these issues? <coughs> of course, we want to maximize the benefit from biotech. But we need to understand that there may be risks and balance risk from all perspectives. We need to have regulations that are effective in containing risk so that potential crops at least go through a decent process, regulatory process, before they're released in the market. And not just biotech crops, but other crops that are formed by other means as well. We need to avoid hiding our problems and romanticizing nature, looking for quick fixes and emphasizing catastrophes. We should avoid overhyping stuff, which of course every time you're looking for a grant you do tend to overhype the potential output of your work. So really that's my introduction to biotech. Now I want to talk about the real talk, which is my areas of research. 
But I won't go on too, on, too long, as Eilish said, I don't like to talk too much. <coughs> so I just want to mention what I've been doing for the last few years. So I've been doing research in both law and computer science. Those little brackets there re represent funding agencies that have provided uh, money to help me do the work that I've been doing. Genome Canada provided a very large grant to some colleagues of mine, biologists at the University of Western Ontario, of which I was a part of, to look at the so-called GEALS issues, that's the ethical, environmental, um, legal and social issues involved with the research. Similarly with the Ontario Research Fund, the Social Science Humanities Research Network, the Privacy a Commissioner and the Law Foundation of Ontario have all provided funds to help me support students primarily to do work. This has two purposes. It allows me to do more, or it has allowed me to do more than I could have by myself. And it also, of course, provides very good training for the students in being able to do research. In computer science, I've had money from the Nas National Science and Engineering Research Council and IBM. And I've been looking primarily, at, recently at least, at cloud computing as well as large system design. So the first little project that I had a look at, which I'd like to mention today, just to give you a sample of the kind of work that I've been doing, is public biobanks. And by public, I don't mean publicly funded, I'll come to that in a minute, but ones that make their uh, collections public in some way or another. I did a very quick survey on location ownership, the types of materials they're keeping, the types of agreements that you had to sign in order to get the materials, uh, their accessibility policies, cost, intellectual property policies as well. We got good useful results from 31 of these biobanks. These biobanks include not only uh, where materials are stored, such as uh, human materials, those are called medical biobanks, but also there's crop biobanks or animal biobanks, where they keep DNA and samples from any different crops, animals, and, and uh, also from people and diseases. So this is where they're located, the ones that we found here and here. And this survey showed that the majority here, 20 out of the 31, were public, seven were private, and four had a mix. And of those, you can see here the plant, animal, and human. The human ones uh, with human biobanks tended to be private, which, as you'll see in the next slide, tended to be more expensive to access the materials, uh, whereas the plant ones tended to be public and typically a great deal cheaper to access the materials that they held in the biobank. And that was just a little cost, um, looking at the costs in, of accessing a uh, accession. So in terms of property rights in those biobanks, most of them follow the international treaty on, uh, at least the plant ones, on plant genetic resources, which gives quite good rights over um, being able to use materials that are supplied from the biobank. Most of them, of course, restrict use to the research organization, and they usually have some type of material transfer agreement. So I thought I'd mention that. There's a paper on it, and um, I'm quite happy to point out where it is, should anyone wish to read it. Uh, another little project has been on, this is quite a big project actually, as part of the GAPM, the Genome Canada project on biotechnology regulation. I have yet to include Australia because it wasn't part of the funded project, Australia. It was Europe and um, uh, North America primarily. So I have drawn many little charts that show the type of processes that different countries in Europe have to go through in order to have a GM crop planted in one of their countries. There are two levels of regulation, at least. There's the EU regulations and then there are domestic regulations. Only a few countries in Europe, Spain, Portugal, Germany, but in Germany there's an issue, allow some cultivation of genetically modified crops. MON810, which is a corn, is one, and the other recently granted is the Amflora potato. 
Canada, for example, has around 60 crops that are grown, or at least approved for growth in Canada. The Amflora potato, which is not for human uh, use, by the way, consumption is for the um, starches in it, it took 14 years for the company to get regulatory approval in Europe. So in France, had some strange activities regarding GMOs. This is the process. I will make these slides available so that you can read this should you be interested. I won't go through them in detail right now. Suffice it to say that in France in 2008, the French government banned Mon 810, that's Monsanto's transgenic corn, on rather poor grounds. And they were sued, taken to court, eventually ended up in the European Court of Justice, which overturned the ban in 2011. The French then turned around and reinstated the ban on slightly different grounds. <laughs> they clearly don't want Mon 810 grown in France, is what you can say. Uh, the UK, again, has a slightly different bunch of regulations. In uh, the UK, they have recently just approved the growth of a tobacco plant that makes an anti-HIV drug. They're beginning trials on some pharmaceutical farming, which is interesting. <coughs> the EU, uh, the, again, the European Court of Justice, uh, comes up with many uh, different judgments. One of them recently was on honey, about this time last year. Uh, they found some holly, honey had some, again, Mon 810 pollen, um, inside it and inside the pollen that was being sold. Uh, but as the Mon 10 was not approved f at that time for commercial growth, um, they said they should not um, sell it at all. In countries that did allow 810, uh, Mon 10 to be uh, grown, they would have to label it saying um, contains GM product. So this kind of problem uh, leads to another area of investigation that I'll get to in a minute, and that's the problem of adventitious presence of GM genes. So just a quick um, high-level view of what's going on here. Um, the system, the basis of the system of how you approve GM products differs substantially from country to country. Uh, the US uh, looks at product and whether it's substantially equivalent. The EU looks at process, and in Canada, rather sensibly, they actually look simply at the plants and see whether it has a novel trait, whether it's produced by uh, transgenic techniques or otherwise. And in Australia, it's based on the definition, again, the product really of uh, uh, the US kind of look. <coughs> Enough on that. Another project, I have been surveying some scientists in labs that worked again on this GAPM, this uh, Genome Canada project, to see what they thought or knew about patents, regulations, and transfer of materials between laboratories. I came up with lots of data, which I have not had time to write up, because I've been too busy <laughs> doing things here. Um, but I shall write this up shortly. Now I have all the data. Suffice it to say that pretty much, as you can see from this uh, Belgium-Canada comparison, most people did not know the right answer, unfortunately. And again, which statements are true? Most people did not know the right answer. I did a weighted uh, survey of about um, 35 questions with a weighted score. And the, the best score would have been about 150. The average across the scientists was about 45 out of 150. This leads one to think perhaps that scientists need to know a little bit about, more about the laws that are involved with the work that they are engaged in as well as lawyers, of course, knowing more about uh, the science as well. These are difficult because they're highly complex problems on both ends of the stick. So one of the things I've been looking at, which kind of brings science and law together, is a mapping project to look at a particular bunch of genes, biotic stress gene patents. So these are the genes that are involved in this particular research project, which is why I chose them. But they're also very important to um, crops. 
So these are the genes that protect, uh, protect um, plants from damage from things like spider mites or fungi or other attacks. So the questions I was thinking about addressing have been who owns them, where they own them, what type of institution owns them, and how will this operate, uh, uh, influence the freedom to operate and research in the area? Um, are there particular groups that these genes are, a company is working with and their relationship to prior art? A lot of them are owned by industry, and quite a few are owned by in, um, in universities as well. And although I say it myself, I have done something rather clever, a patent cartography, which has, I'll zoom in so you can see what it is, um, the companies and the location of the patents, and from each of those tiny dots in another chart, which I won't show you because it's a bit small, it has a link to prior art, that's earlier patents that these patents rely on. So these maps hopefully will be able to be used as a great tool that help you see, if you're a researcher, which companies are working on which kind of patents in which area. So I do have some other research uh, areas. Um, I mentioned before the adventitious presence of GM genes in non-GM crops is one. I just submitted a paper on that. Uh, crops from uh, other extreme genetic modification, uh, issues in the EU, I need to write up those charts, I also need to write up the scientist survey, and I'm working on a paper on cloud computing and privacy, and also working on open science. Suffice it to say on the low level presence, and I think this is an important thing, is that you are going to be eating GM even if you think you're not nowadays, and it may not even be approved in Australia. There's a 1% tolerance level for Australia. Europe currently has a 0%, which is a problem. They're going to redefine zero to be 0.1, I think. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, if anyone's interested in that paper, I'd be happy to point them at that too. So why am I doing all this work, I suppose? Um, I suppose my aim really is to improve the knowledge, the legal knowledge, and the knowledge of biotech issues to form some kind of bridge between law and science so that both sides can communicate with each other better so that we can have better outcomes both in policy and perhaps in the science as well. Part of this of course involves improving scientists' knowledge of legal areas and I'm always happy to talk to scientists who are interested and also perhaps help lawyers with science. I'm not the person to do that. It's taken me a long time to learn a very, very tiny bit of biology. Improving communication between government scientists, lawyers, and the community is something that has been constant over the ages, but today, with the rapid rate of change in our technologies, is something that is more urgently needed to be addressed. I'm happy, of course, to work with pretty much anyone who's interested to work with this. So biotech is going to be the technology of uh, the next, this decade probably, and certainly the next. And given our climates are changing, that our needs for crops are changing, that the population is, what, 7 billion now, and is growing. Um, we really need to think about how can we best regulate to get the best results from science. So really this, is, um, this has been a very long talk for me <laughs> and I should wrap up and thank uh, my collaborators, Drs. Jervik, Jervik and Krishna, uh, my former postdoctoral fellows, Margoni and Kaki, who's the current fellow, the last one, and also some postgraduates and research assistants. Um, there's more than on the list there, have been a lot. And funders, of course, are very important, I should thank them. And I'd wish to thank, yet again, the University of uh, New England and the City of Armidale for giving me this opportunity to talk, and Dave, Steve and Marina, who were really helpful in uh, getting our setup done here today with very little pain. Thanks so much for listening. Um, your thanks go to you for turning out and coming in to listening to me to rabbit on. And uh, there's a few papers at that website that you can have a look at if you feel like it. Thank you. Clearly, Mark is not only a man of the world and a nice guy, 
but clearly he's a man of many words, at least at times, <laughs> and he's also a very funny guy. Um, now we come to a point in our inaugural lecture where it's traditional for us to uh, invite a colleague of the inaugural lecturer to come and offer a, a vote of thanks on our behalf. Uh, and so I'd like to invite Associate Professor, uh, Professor Lillian Corbin to the podium to reflect on Mark's lecture. Well, distinguished guests, um, ladies and gentlemen, and of course, Professor Perry. <laughs> it's a great honour to um, present this vote of thanks after hearing that wonderful lecture. Um, I count it a privilege to be a colleague of, of Mark's and I'm sure all of those in the law school do as well. Professor Perry, as you heard, has only been at the uh, University of New England for a couple of months. And, and perhaps we think, well, why did we wait this long to, to hear him speak, especially hearing how entertaining he is, etc. tonight. But in some ways it makes a lot of sense because it's given us a time to get to know him in our law school in particular. And during that time, uh, it's made us really want to come tonight because we respect his expertise. We have also observed his administrative wisdom and as Eilish mentioned, his collegiality. And in my view, that's a really important um, characteristic to have in any kind of um, uh, academic, uh, academic pursuit. Because as we heard, he is very, very good at making those links with other disciplines. And we'd like to suggest that help, help us to do a bit more of that, because we come a little isolated sometimes as lawyers. So tonight we've been very privileged to hear more of his research, hear more of his work, and it's incredibly interesting, as I know you've all thought. It also has persuaded us that we, in the law school in particular, ought to be a little bit more outward looking. And it's to challenge us to recognise that science can teach us a lot. And so I suppose his message to us tonight is get with the program. And particularly when he talked about regulation and law, you know, there's so many questions there about where does law, does, does it regulate to, to such an extent that it actually pushes out some of the good things that science is, is suggesting. So we need to be very, very careful in our deliberations and be working with the knowledge of science and being very careful to bring in all those suggestions that um, Mark has talked about tonight. So, Professor Mark Perry, thank you very much for the presentation tonight. Um, and we look forward to our association with you and to your um, our partner, Dr Krishna, as well. We hope you spend many happy years at the University of New England with us. And we've had a, a, a very interesting evening, I'm sure. Could you all join with me, please, in uh, showing our appreciation in the usual way?